In honor of the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, this exploration was made possible by Audible. When President Kennedy met Soviet Premier Khrushchev in Vienna in June of 1961, some items on the agenda were clear. Laos, Cuba, Berlin, and the threat of war there. But the conversation quickly veered off course. When Vice President Nixon had met Khrushchev in 1959, two years earlier, he had become ensnared in an ideological debate about the relative merits of capitalism versus socialism. There are some instances where you may be ahead of us. For example, in the development of, your, of the thrust of your rockets for the investigation of outer space. There may be some instances, for example, color television, where we're ahead of you. For both of us to benefit, for both of us to benefit, you see, you never concede anything. Now, two years later, President Kennedy fell into the same trap with Khrushchev, even against warnings from his advisors not to do so. On the first day of their summit, Kennedy lectured Khrushchev about supporting communist minorities in Asia, while a bellicose Khrushchev yelled about American use of the word miscalculation. That damned word, miscalculation. You ought to take that word and bury it in cold storage and never use it again. I'm sick of it. The summit was slowly becoming a disaster. In the rubble of crumbled relations, the two leaders had lunch together. Memos of the mealtime conversation describe it as social in nature. When the conversation turned to space, Kennedy threw out what seemed to be a far-fetched idea. Instead of racing, the USA, the Soviet Union, why not go to the moon together? No, replied Khrushchev, likely quite terse. Then the Soviet premier hesitated. All right, why not? Let's backtrack a few years to get you the full picture. First, I need to tell you about the pressure on the USA and therefore on President Kennedy. By the time he offered a joint venture to the moon to the Soviet premier, the Soviets had actually already won the space race. Twice. Those are the beeps of Sputnik, the first artificial satellite in Earth's orbit. Its launch by the Soviet Union, October 4th, 1957, was heralded as one of the pivotal moments in human history, the inauguration of the space age. Scientists were rejoicing, said Eric Severide of CBS, that the nascent, godlike instinct of Homo sapiens has driven him from his primordial mud to break, at last, the bound of this Earth. Hannah Arendt, philosopher and political theorist, opined that the launch was the most important event in human history, not even second to the splitting of the atom. A French daily added, myth has become reality, Earth's gravity conquered. The Soviets had won the race to space. But not everyone was celebrating. The launch of Sputnik was clear evidence to many that the United States was scientifically behind. Even if Sputnik was just a metal ball with a battery broadcasting a radio signal, it was 180 pounds of so-called Soviet Red Moon passing over the United States twice a day. It was seen as a national emergency. Public opinion began to shift in the US and Western Europe. With rockets like this, the Soviets were ahead scientifically and militarily. Was this proof that their system was inherently better? Scientists, engineers, and workers reared by our communist party in accordance with an advanced technology, wrote a French physicist and communist. The whole world saw yet one more extraordinary important demonstration of the socialist system's superiority. For others, like Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Baines Johnson, the problem was more existential. Soon they will be dropping bombs on us from space like kids dropping rocks onto cars from freeway overpasses. Out of the public anger about the so-called missile gap and President Eisenhower's apathy on the matter, the Congress passed the National Aeronautics and Space Act, formally creating the civilian-led National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. In terms of intercontinental rockets, the US actually caught up pretty fast, but perception didn't match this classified reality. And then another body blow. Just three years later, and only three months into the Kennedy administration, the Soviets won another version of the space race. They launched cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin into Earth's orbit. President Kennedy lamented the fact that the Soviets were the first to put a man in space. As I said in my State of the Union, the news will be worse before it's better, and it will be some time before we catch up. We are, I hope, going to go in other areas where we can be first and which will bring perhaps more long-range benefits to uh, mankind. But here, we're behind. This frame of a race, language like we are behind, we are ahead, was shared by both Kennedy and Khrushchev, who 
on the same day said, let the capitalist countries catch up with our country. But this statement was more general. There was no preset race to the moon as we like to see it today. No starting gun went off at the end of World War II, while the US and Soviets were snatching up rocket scientists from the rubble of Germany explicitly so they could go to the moon. No. These countries wanted rocket technology so they could aim nuclear weapons at each other. The progenitor of America's rocket program, and eventually the moon landing itself, was Vanna von Braun, a Nazi scientist running a slave factory producing V-2 rockets to launch at England. Sure, people had dreamed of exploring the cosmos forever, and human flight to space had been romanticized by authors like H.G. Wells at the turn of the century, but geopolitics drove development. And politicians, Stalin, Truman, Eisenhower, they weren't dreaming of the moon. Eisenhower wanted to cut budgets, not take on expensive new exploratory programs. Humanist pioneering was an afterthought. A cynic might even call it military marketing. This is the irony of the space race. Deep down, it was an attempt to create technology capable of carrying apocalyptic weapons across the globe but sold as peaceful scientific discoveries for all humanity. Once the Soviets could put a warhead on an intercontinental missile, as Sputnik was perceived to be a demonstration of in 57, they won the race. Only someone truly dynamic could shift the goalposts of American shame to something other than military supremacy. Shift the goal to say, a race to put a man on the moon. Let both sides seek to invoke the wonders of science instead of its terrors. Together, let us explore the stars. Let's not slip into great man history. Despite the soaring rhetoric, Kennedy's space policy was scant in the transition and first few months of his administration. He lacked the intellectual curiosity to grasp space-related science. He once told his NASA administrator that I'm not that interested in space. It was all a political matter to him, and besides closing the perceived US-Soviet missile gap, a phrase he coined, Kennedy was prepared to delegate matters of outer space to Vice President Johnson. And as we know, within three months of Kennedy taking office, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to orbit the Earth. US prestige was at an all-time low following the successful launch and return of Gagarin. If Sputnik had suggested to the public that the U.S. was scientifically inferior, Gagarin's flight confirmed it. A Washington Post editorial called it a psychological victory of the first magnitude for the Soviet Union. And it was only under this crushing embarrassment that President Kennedy started searching for an opportunity, as he put it, to leapfrog the Soviet Union in space. At the White House after the Gagarin flight, he gesticulated nervously while asking his advisors, is there any place we can catch them? Can we go around the moon before them? Can we put a man on the moon before them? His mind was still racing a few days later in a meeting with the vice president. Do we have a chance of beating the Soviets by putting a laboratory into space? Or by a trip around the moon? Or by a rocket to land on the moon? Or by a rocket to go to the moon and back with a man? April 14th through 21st, 1961, defined the young president's thinking on space policy. He decided, quote, there's nothing more important. And when pressed in public on April 21st, he finally let the public in on his thinking. If we can get to the moon before the Russians, then we should. But it was at this critical moment that a confident Nikita Khrushchev sensed panic, not strength, in the White House. It wasn't just America dragging behind in space. The Soviet premier delighted in a failed CIA-backed invasion of Fidel Castro's Cuba. He perceived Kennedy waffling on divided Berlin and pursuing a mixed policy in Laos. In Khrushchev's eyes, while the president was off balance, it was the perfect time to meet face to face. On May 12th, he accepted Kennedy's months old request to have a diplomatic summit on the issues of the day. Khrushchev planned to meet Kennedy, and Khrushchev planned to rattle him. Kennedy, for his part, was in a deep depression over perceived vulnerability, and he was eager to project strength in any way possible. And so, unusually, on May 25th, he held a second State of the Union address, just a week before his meeting with Khrushchev. He called for 1.8 billion in defense assistance, increased NATO strength, quicker army deployment, and a larger Marine Corps. And finally, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. 
No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. It was the only thing the president could do to stabilize the American position before meeting with Khrushchev in Vienna. This was the scene at Vienna's airport when President Kennedy's plane arrived on the morning of Saturday, June 3rd. The world beset by problems of Berlin and Laos, nuclear testing and disarmament, looked to Vienna as the President of the United States arrived. As we already know, the meeting in Vienna was a disaster from the start. The president veered into an ideological debate with Khrushchev, and the premier, sensing weakness, berated Kennedy to force his way. He beat the hell out of me, Kennedy told James Reston of the Times. It was the worst thing in my life. He savaged me. In the summit's worst moment, Kennedy threatened nuclear war over Berlin. Khrushchev said, if the US wanted war, that was its problem. To which Kennedy responded, if that's true, it's going to be a long winter. And yet, in the midst of this tension, and during a lunch break, there was this offer from Kennedy on space. The US and the Soviets could go to the moon together. Given the context, Khrushchev must have thought it was a joke or a ploy from a country desperately behind in space technology. When he initially answered, sure, why not? He couldn't have been serious. In fact, the very next day, he reneged on the whole thing. Besides a passing reference in a telegram from Khrushchev to Kennedy to pool their resources to master the universe, the idea of a joint venture to the moon was basically dead. There simply wasn't enough trust. Any trust, for that matter. However, this isn't the end of our story. Though the summit may have gone down in flames, three shards gleamed in the ashes. First, Khrushchev implicitly accepted Kennedy's frame. The space race would now specifically be a race to the moon. Though with Sputnik and Gagarin, the Soviets had won two space races of a kind, a third finish line now appeared before them. Second, in June of 62, the governments did agree to extremely limited collaboration on weather information and geomagnetic mapping. Which plays into third, though nuclear conflict between the US and USSR was more likely than ever after the summit, the seed of cooperation was planted by Kennedy's offer. It's something that neither man would completely forget. In the year following the Vienna summit, things got much worse. The Soviets started construction on the Berlin Wall, dividing their sector of the city from the area controlled by the Americans, British, and French. In April of 1962, 15 Jupiter missiles with nuclear warheads deployed by the United States to Turkey became, quote, ready, manned, operational. And therefore, feeling threatened by active American warheads just one country over, Khrushchev decided to return the favor by shipping and operationalizing nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba. Khrushchev also thought that having missiles pointed at the U.S. in Fidel Castro's Cuba would bolster his allies' position, increase bargaining power in Berlin, and show Soviet conviction to balance power across the globe. It didn't take long for an American U-2 spy plane to detect and photograph the ballistic facilities in Cuba. The president's national security advisor brought him the news in the early morning of October 15th. Kennedy expressed surprise that Khrushchev had taken it so far. At this point, any escalation could lead to nuclear war. Going nuclear wasn't just an option, it was the probable outcome. That's partly because of the threats Kennedy and Khrushchev exchanged in Vienna, but also because the Joint Chiefs of Staff and members of Congress were urging aggressive countermeasures. Bomb the sites, then invade Cuba. But Kennedy wasn't ready to make a decision based in fear or pride. He wondered if Khrushchev would feel the same. The moment called for action, but also for self-control and restraint. If he listened to those telling him to bomb and invade right away, to do what they want us to do, Kennedy said, none of us will be alive later to tell them that they were wrong. Instead, the president went on television on October 22nd to announce a blockade of Cuba and urge Khrushchev to disassemble Soviet missiles. He also sent Khrushchev a letter. I have not assumed that you or any other sane man would, in this nuclear age, deliberately plunge the world into war which it is crystal clear no country could win. The response from Khrushchev continued the lack of trust from back in Vienna. Mr. President, the actions of the United States with regard to Cuba constitute outright banditry, or if you like, the folly of degenerate imperialism. Unfortunately, such folly can bring grave suffering to the peoples of all countries. 
an American visitor of Premier Khrushchev said he seemed to be deciding between anger and fear. At this moment, the two leaders were echoing similar thoughts, even if it wasn't apparent in their letters. Would the lives of millions be extinguished in an angry moment? Was there any way they could climb down? On the 25th, Kennedy wrote another letter. I repeat my regret that these events should cause a deterioration in our relations. He expressed hope that Khrushchev's government would take the necessary action to permit a restoration of the earlier situation. Basically, could we go back to a time two weeks ago when our relations were just terrible, but not apocalyptic? Since you're here, alive, listening to the sound of my voice, you know this conflict didn't result in nuclear war. Khrushchev was panicked by the idea of a war in the Caribbean he knew he would lose. Startled by Fidel Castro's desire to launch a preemptive nuclear strike on the United States, and also, maybe, according to Khrushchev's son Sergei, touched and impressed by Kennedy's October 25th letter. The Soviets took their missiles out of Cuba. The US promised never to invade Cuba and took their missiles out of Turkey. The world didn't end in 1962. So where does this leave us in terms of space? If you had asked a concerned, scared citizen staring down the barrel of oblivion in October of 1962, if the current Cuban Missile Crisis would increase or decrease the likelihood of the US and Soviets going to the moon together in a joint project, they'd have slapped you and said, of course it decreases the chances, since when was that even an option? But that isn't true. The Missile Crisis spooked both men. We know Kennedy felt the burden of civilization throughout, and Khrushchev later wrote in his memoirs about the eeriness of two men across the globe, each with their finger on the button. Approaching the edge of nuclear war together seemed to convince both men of the need for improved relations. And having gone through this trial by non-fire together, a chance to build trust emerged. If they could dodge the apocalypse together, could they do the only other thing that would be more historically significant? Could they put someone on the rock nearest our own, so at least when the next nuclear showdown broke out, someone would be away to watch and to weep? They started with Baby Steps, a system for quicker communications between Washington and Moscow, known as the Red Phone in popular culture. Efforts to negotiate a treaty banning testing of nuclear weapons re-emerged and concluded successfully less than a year later. And important to our story, they started to build trust in a series of letters. Khrushchev to Kennedy. There lies ahead for you and me a great serious talk on other questions. Kennedy to Khrushchev. It is of great importance that we should try to understand each other clearly. I fear that there may have been an honest misunderstanding between us. The letters could be sprawling policy disagreements, but also deeply personal. Khrushchev to Kennedy. Accept, Mr. President, our sincere sympathy on the loss that has befallen you, the death of your newly born son. Sincerely yours, Nikita Khrushchev. The relationship had transformed from the belligerence in Vienna to cordiality and tentative trust. After the missile crisis, as Khrushchev biographer William Taubman put it, Khrushchev needed Kennedy and thought Kennedy needed him. He wasn't wrong. Kennedy was under pressure at home. In 1963, costs from the Apollo project were starting to add up, as well as criticisms from Congress. Strong doubts also came from civil rights leaders in black newspapers, who wondered how a government could prioritize a moonshot over civil rights or economic disparity on Earth. <laughs> as one author put it in their piece, only way I could get to the moon is to be the first janitor there. The clock was ticking on the political will for a trip to the moon, and therefore there was an opening for something different. Kennedy decided to step into that opening. On September 20th, 1963, he spoke before the United Nations. In the field of space, there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts in the regulation and exploration of space. I include among these possibilities a joint expedition to the moon, why, therefore, should man's first flight to the moon be a matter of national competition? Was this idea feasible? Both the national security apparatus of the U.S. and the Soviet Politburo would have needed to sign off. A challenging ask. And historians debate if Kennedy was serious. Contemporaries doubted whether it could be done 
even if the political will was there to try. And over a month of Soviet silence on the issue after Kennedy's speech seemed to confirm those doubts. It was another moment when critics of Kennedy were highly annoyed. The same naivete that led to a disastrous summit in Vienna. The same empty rhetoric like with civil rights. Embracing idealism, celebrating values while falling so terribly short of them. The president looked good, spoke well, but youth and dynamism can't will policy into being. However, to the surprise of many, on November 1st, 1963, Nikita Khrushchev appeared to give a tentative acceptance on the joint moon mission offer. We consider with due attention to the proposal of the US president, specifically for arranging a joint flight to the moon. What could be better than to send a Russian and an American together, or better still, a Russian man and an American woman? Was Khrushchev serious? WDK in John F. Kennedy and the Two Faces of the US Space Program seemed to think Khrushchev was mocking Kennedy. However, John M. Logston came to the conclusion that Khrushchev was serious. He used Khrushchev's son Sergei as evidence. Sergei said that after Kennedy's UN speech, Khrushchev, quote, openly spoke about cooperating with the United States on a lunar landing project. He began to trust Kennedy more. Had there been a shift since Vienna? Since the Cuban Missile Crisis? Through minuscule collaborations, through a test ban treaty, through phone lines and letters, there might have been a change. What had been scoffed at in Vienna was now a real possibility. Kennedy had framed the struggle for offensive weaponry instead as a race to the moon. And now, competition could potentially be cooperation, born of a nuclear struggle on Earth. Idealism might actually be winning. The administration jumped at Khrushchev's opening. On November 12, 1963, President Kennedy signed a memo on cooperation with the USSR on outer space matters. On November 15, 1963, Bobby Kennedy spoke of a do-over of the Vienna summit, minus the hostility. JFK and Khrushchev would sit down over a few days and work out their affairs. According to the Soviet ambassador, Khrushchev was determined to make a success of his second summit with Kennedy. There was never a guarantee, maybe not even a likelihood, but there was a chance. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. An abridged letter from Jacqueline Kennedy to Nikita Khrushchev, December 1st, 1963. Dear Mr. Chairman President, In one of the last nights I will spend in the White House, in one of the last letters I will write on this paper at the White House, I would like to write you my message. I send it only because I know how much my husband cared about peace. You and he were adversaries, but you were allied in a determination that the world should not be blown up. The danger which troubled my husband was that war might be started not so much by the big men as by the little ones. While big men know the need for self-control and restraint, little men are sometimes moved more by fear and pride. I send this letter because I know so deeply of the importance of the relationship which existed between you and my husband, and also because of your kindness and that of Mrs. Khrushchev in Vienna. I read that she had tears in her eyes when she left the American embassy in Moscow. Please thank her for that. Sincerely, Jacqueline Kennedy. 
One aspect of this story that I haven't touched on is the scientific community and characters in the United States and the Soviet Union. That and much, much more is covered in American Moonshot, John F. Kennedy and the Great Space Race by Douglas Brinkley. So why not listen to it for free during your 30-day free trial of Audible? Audible is where so many inspiring voices and compelling stories open listeners up to new experiences and ways of thinking. Audible delivers bestsellers, self-improvement, memoirs, history, and more, all professionally narrated by actors, authors, and motivational superstars. Audible members now get more than ever before. Members choose three titles every month, one audiobook plus two Audible originals that you can't hear anywhere else, plus free access to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post delivered daily to the Audible app. Start listening with a 30-day Audible trial and your first audiobook plus two Audible originals are free. Visit audible.com slash the exploration, no space, or text the exploration to 500-500. That's 500-500. That's audible.com slash the exploration or text the exploration to 500-500. Link in the description. Later, y'all.